and the aforementioned Tom Wheeler, former is. chair of the Federal Communications Commission. We have two other experts in, on these commissions, former Commissioner Julie Brill, who's now at Microsoft, former chair Maureen Oldhausen, who is now at a law firm, Washington Baker Botts. And uh, of course, this is Silicon Flatter, and so we have a law professor with us as well. Um, He's just at Berkeley Law School, uh, Bolt Hall, is it still known as? And finally, a double threat, both economist and a lawyer, former chief economist at the FCC, um, Babette Bullock, who's right next to me. Um, this is truly a all-star panel, and it is great to be back at Silicon Flatirons with such uh, tremendous folks in the room. Um, I want to jump right in, picking up on the senator's premise. And I, I just want to see if there's maybe some polite pushback or elaboration. I know we're going to hear some elaboration from Tom Wheeler. I'll let him go first. But the premise is the existing tools, the Sherman Antitrust Act, um, the Federal Trade Commission's uh, current Consumer Protection Authority are insufficient to meet the challenge of internet platforms, and I think to touch on the theme Senator Bennett hit so beautifully, protecting our democracy, teen mental health, privacy, competition, and the advent of algorithms with impacts that we can't glimpse. Um, so first, to amplify that, um, Senator Wheeler, anything you, or Senator Wheeler, uh, <laughs> Tom, uh, any uh, former uh, experiences you want to call on or present thoughts to, to marshal this case? Why are the current tools insufficient? That would invite for this kind of discussion. Because if I can add a It's going to start with understanding, start with discussion and organizing that begins at places like Colorado Law and is made possible by the fact that Silicon Flatirons, created by our friend Mr. Weiser, uh, create that form. Now, after having filibustered, let me uh, specifically respond to your question. But, oh, good. So, all right, so we try this. Hey, good. Um, the challenge that we have, I'm, I'm obsessed right now with a concept that we must change in order to preserve. And those are two concepts that seem to be uh, opposites. If we want to preserve the kinds of things that have made America great, basic things like, like individual rights, consumer protection, competition, uh, markets that work. Um, we have to change the way in which we have the structure that counterbalances the power that the digital technology has created in one component of the economy. The, you know, here I am sitting between two FTC commissioners. God bless the FTC. You know, what a job that agency has, has, has done. And how unfair to them um, to expect them, in addition to everything else, to shoulder this whole new responsibility while at the same time de dealing with the rest of the economy. And the challenge that we face is that the rules that created the statutes, the concepts that created the statutes and the structures that are the countervailing force to economic power in this economy, 
were designed around in an industrial era around the challenges represented in the industrial economy, which I submit are different from the challenges created in the digital economy. And therefore we need to have the ability to say, we must change the way we protect these basic concepts that we want to preserve. So I wanna have our professors go first and our practitioners go second. So first, Teja, that is a um, important concept that the digital economy is fundamentally different and the tools for what Senator Bennett called the analog economy are just insufficient. What do you think about that proposition? So I, um, it's a nice, I think it's a really nice way of, of encapsulating some of the challenges we face today. I might, I might modify it slightly to say that while many of the challenges that we face today are new, they find echoes in some of the challenges that we've seen before. So I think a lot of the problems that we see with modern internet platforms are problems that we've seen in the past, right? So we've seen a tendency towards market concentration and standing alone, that's not so problematic, but um, where that concentration is a function of things that we have traditionally assessed under a rubric of natural monopoly, things like economies of scale or network effects, uh, we have tried to regulate them in order to address those problems of concentration. Um, I think we're also seeing increasingly, and this relates to some of the things that Senator Bennett talked about in terms of uh, mental health and uh, issues of uh, body images with teens, and I think also digital discrimination, that these private platforms are not really responding to market incentives, or th the market incentives are not there to respond to these sorts of problems that are specific to teens or historically disadvantaged populations. Um, and lastly, and most, I think the most important thing about the case for an agency, and we'll talk a little bit more about whether it's a new one or this one, is that there's a real lack of democratic voice in the way these governance decisions are being made. The, the, if we think of what Twitter or Facebook or any of these large platforms of what they're doing as largely about you know, democratic governance, speech, the way we communicate in, in the run up to an election, for example, um, it's made in private halls, in executive chambers, um, and there's not a lot of opportunity for us to participate. And I think an agency model gives more democratic voice to these essential facilities of democratic governance. Bebe? Uh, so, like a good professor, I'm not quite satisfied with the question posed to me, so I'm going to redo it in the question I want to answer. Um, and that was uh, the first one, which was basically, do we believe that there are insufficient laws to deal with this new uh, or characterize as, as new um, uh, industry? And uh, perhaps surprisingly, I uh, am going to say, yes, I do think there are some insufficient laws. That might be surprising to people who know sort of my background and where I am. Uh, but that said, uh, the reason I can say that is the proposal made is so profoundly broad. Uh, we're looking at proposals that deal with privacy, that deal with mental health, that deal with competition law, that deal with uh, strong uh, democratic traditions of free speech and and even up to First Amendment concerns. So given the breadth of the different concerns that are being enunciated, I can firmly say, yes, something is not covered by the laws. Uh, I'm on the record personally of being very concerned about the lack of privacy laws. They have not been since 1970. And even then was for a very different sort of uh, character of uh, privacy disse dissemination. Uh, so I do firmly believe that we should revisit privacy laws and have some direction in that case. However, uh, the breadth of this is also, I think it, it's failing. Uh, there, it's so broad as it, as it could sort of uh, fall apart under its own weight. Uh, there's too much that would lend itself to disagreement. I actually agree as well that many of these questions that we're looking at that are being raised as concerns, and I think they are legitimate concerns. You see them written in, in various different news sources and everything. So there is something bubbling up, a, a disquiet of the public 
that um, uh, with regard to our relationship with these uh, um, large platforms. But I do think many of these problems we definitely have seen before and we can echo, uh, we hear those echoes and we can deal with them in, in very clear ways. To merge all these concerns together, I think we lose the plot. Uh, these are very different platforms. Uh, uh, concern of Amazon may not be the same concerns that we have with Facebook. And the moment we start talking about Facebook and YouTube and others that deal with content, you are in a different ballpark than you are with antitrust or other privacy concerns. Uh, because as we know, the term, for example, misinformation is not a self-defining term. And we have seen that misinformation uh, and using that moniker can basically be used uh, to stifle free speech of things which are merely controversial, uh, things that need to be said, whether it's in the scientific realm, even as we've seen with the rise of COVID and the use of vaccines and concerns with those and real public concerns about what that impact may be, the policies that have come forward, uh, those have been deemed uh, misinformation. And we know that current agencies have uh, done what they could to try and influence uh, the, the rise of content that would be uh, opposed to public policy. And that's without creating a hammer of an agency that is directly looking at that nail. So I am concerned by the breadth of this, uh, but yes, to circle back, I do think there's insufficient loss. <laughs> All right, so Maureen and Julie, Senator Bennett made a point that may have uh, been a little bit of a uh, sore spot or at least a um, painful memory because when the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau was created, a lot of its authority literally, and some of its people I think too, came from the Federal Trade Commission. The premise was the FTC was not positioned to do that. We need a new agency. Um, having lived through that experience, what is your thought about that analogy? Uh, and how does that apply here to the question, do we need new agency? Julie, want to go first and Maureen can go second. Okay, but that's kind of a boring question, Phil. I mean, I'm happy to answer it. But, um, I mean, uh, look, uh, I think the point about the CFPB is the same point about the Department of Homeland Security. I mean, in the last 22 years, two agencies have been created. They've both been created in a crisis. And so the question that I think the Senator was raising was, are we in a crisis now? And do we have the political will as well as the policy chops to carve out a remit for a new agency to address these crises? So I'm gonna answer that question, okay? Thanks. Um, um, so look, I, I uh, whether, whether or not we wanna get into an agency or what agency it should be, or whether we augment a current, the current powers. I think we need to think about four predicates to this conversation. And the first one I would say is something that the Senator talked about, which is you have to recognize that we do have a crisis now. And the tech industry in particular, and frankly, I would say all of the business community needs to recognize that there is a crisis because what is tech now? Like, like our cars technology, you know, our pharmaceuticals technology? The answer actually is yes, but there are clearly problems with certain types of technology that we do need to address. And I think the two crises that I see are, the, are one that the Senator talked about, which is uh, mental health of youth. And that I think should allow us to move forward to handle some of the kinds of First Amendment issues that and speech issues that Yvette was talking about. And the second one, which people don't like to talk about because it's deeply uncomfortable, and yet it is also vastly important, and that is what is happening to children online in terms of sexual and abusive material. So when you think about the spectrum of speech and you worry about things like misinformation, disinformation, yes, I get that there's gonna be, end up being a debate about that, when you talk about the mental health of kids and suicides on the one hand, and you talk about very, very young children being sexually abused on video, you know, there's just like no question there that that is 
number one, not speech, it's just harm. And number two, that there's a lot that uh, the governments can do about it. They're, we're doing some, but we could do a tremendous amount more. And there's a lot more that the tech community can do about it. So I think that that's the first predicate, just like, what is the crisis? Let's define it. Maybe not chop off everything in the world. Let's just talk about like the really horrendous stuff and see if we can even address that. I'd say the second predicate is getting back to the job of compromise. I mean, I really think that one of the difficulties we have in terms of this space, in terms of any space in the United States about what we want to do with respect to regulation, what we want to do to progress as a society in whatever form, regulations, laws, or otherwise, is we just have lost the ability to compromise. And that's on both sides. I'm not trying to say that that's one or the other, but unless you can have a conversation about what's really harmful, do we wanna iterate? Do we wanna focus on the worst stuff? Do we wanna to try to swallow everything? I mean, that's a worthwhile conversation to have, but understanding what the debate is and then trying to talk about it is just a lost art. And uh, I, I think it was Babette who mentioned the privacy situation. I mean, it's absurd. 150 jurisdictions around the world have comprehensive privacy laws. The United States joins North Korea, Somalia. I mean, the, there's a handful of countries that do not yet either have a privacy law or a serious discussion about their privacy laws as is happening in India. And I think it's just because we've lost to compromise. Um, and the fact that we don't legislate doesn't mean that the rest of the world isn't legislating. I mean, the rest of the world is legislating. It just means that the U.S. is part of the conversation. We're not setting the norms. The rest of the world is setting the norms. Okay, quickly, the two other things that I think that we need to think of as predicates to just this conversation is that democracies need to work together on this, that we, there's a lot we can learn from Europe, and I look forward to that part of the conversation because they are eons ahead in terms of dealing with of these issues. And I think the United States should learn a lot from their approaches. And then I think we need to think more creatively across domains. Like I, so I already mentioned, well, I, it, there's privacy and safety. There's uh, cybersecurity and privacy. There's protection of public health and all of these domains. And we need to think about how do we balance the concerns in each of these domains so that we come to the right outcome. So it, it requires more expansive way of thinking. And Maureen, feel free to lean into the next point, which is to the extent we need new tools, for example, privacy. One proposal is just give the FTC that authority as opposed to create a new agency. And there's certainly a fair bit of critique that sometimes these new agencies, Department of Homeland Security being another one, may not actually accomplish all that much new as opposed to giving a new agency. So what are your thoughts on do we need new tools and, and who do we give them to? Yeah, th thanks, Phil, and th thanks, thanks for having me. I'm de delighted to be here to talk. And um, so I do think we are at a point where it makes sense to create a new federal privacy law. Um, often people talk about, we've never faced this kind of situation before. That's not actually true. When you go back and you look at the debates around the enactment of the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which had to do with the collection and use and sharing of very sensitive data, where people said, there are big computers and they're making decisions about me and I feel it's outside of my control. Congress stepped in and said, well, we're gonna create the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which has rules and restrictions about how that type of data can be used and shared. It gives um, consumers the ability to have insight into it, to challenge it for correctness, but it also has the ability for that data to still be used for very beneficial purposes for society overall, which is accurate credit um, uh, decisions. While individual consumers might say, well, I, if I have bad credit, I wish they could, didn't report it accurately, but overall, we're, be we're better off for that. So I think it's important to look at what has worked in the past and not you know, miss that wisdom. But moving forward, I think we do need a new federal privacy law, and I think it is incumbent on Congress to enact that. Uh, one of the challenges that I think we keep hearing about is, well, if Congress won't act, ergo, we should have agencies step 
into, into the breach. And we had a question from a student about West Virginia versus EPA. Um, and I do think it really is up to Congress to make these very difficult trade-offs and these hard um, political decisions. Uh, but then I do think the FTC has done a pretty good job um, you know, in, in the past using its very general authority over unfair and deceptive acts or practices to address privacy. So I find that there's a little bit of this disconnect to say, well, yeah, they did a good job, they did that, but if we're gonna give out new tools, we're gonna to give it to somebody totally different rather than the agency that I think has you know, really tried to be smart about it and to, to, be, to be forward thinking. Um, I also think one of the challenges is the, the, what the boundaries, right, of who competes with whom and things like that are very amorphous these days. And, and the idea that um, if we sort of draw a box around certain tech companies and say, okay, they're in a different category, um, they're going to be regulated differently than others in the economy, I'm not sure that's accurate anymore. I, I see a lot of competition kind of across different dimensions. Um, so I think one of the things we need to pay attention to is what is going to be the competitive impact of how we do these things. Like, for example, GDPR in Europe, um, you know, ha took a certain approach. Um, a lot of the concerns about GDPR were driven by the idea that we have big companies, big tech companies, they have information, you know, about um, citizens, we're concerned about how they use it. And then the way they implemented that, it actually had a competitive impact that drove some of the smaller players outside of, out of the market. So we do really need to pay attention to that. And I think that was one of the benefits of having an agency like the FTC that has a competition lens also pay, pay attention to these issues. And one other thing that I wanna mention, I think that that touched on this is, um, there's a lot of concerns about misinformation, but I think everyone has this idea of like the other guys, the ones engaging in misinformation, not the people I, it's not the people I agree with. Um, and I think one of the things that we've seen from the release of the Twitter files and you know a whole bunch of you know, reassessment that's going on about what happened during the pandemic is sort of this government influence over the debate, I think has created a sense that it you know, led to a little bit of um, maybe a mono thinking that perhaps society would have been better off if more voices had been able to talk to talk about these things. So I do have some concerns about having a government agency play an even more explicit role in that. Uh, because right now we're at a point where I think trust in information from any source, whether it's the government or whether it's from media is at an all time low. So I think we really need to be careful about doing something that exacerbates that um, because it's, you know, it's not, it's not a good, it's not, definitely not a, a good, a good environment. Um, so with that, I will, I will stop um, and look All forward right. to the next question. Well, thank you. I was, I was going to go to you next Tom. So um, we're not going to do justice to this whole topic, unfortunately, including the dimension that a number of states, including Colorado have adopted privacy laws in the absence of the federal leadership. So Tom, you absolutely deserve a right of reply here, which is you've got, um, I guess, a consensus on the panel that we need some new tools that aren't in existing law. Uh, but I think you may have some skepticism that it should be a new agency as opposed to picking up Maureen's um, point for the Federal Trade Commission. Why not, whatever new authorities we're gonna have, why not just give them to the FTC? Well, a couple of, first I want to associate myself with Julie's point number two, which is that we need to find ways of discussing these and agreeing and compromising rather than it's my way or the highway. So let's start with that as the as, as the given. I also need to point out that uh, Brad Smith, who was one of the great leaders in the tech space, um, had a wonderful blog. some kind of an agency to be dealing with. Did Brad call for a new agency? He, he said we should. You can say what you want. <laughs> <laughs> it was close enough for me. <laughs> we have a problem and we need to address it. 
So look, here's the issue. Yeah. I want to. I, hooray! And I think that the got to be working together here. There, there are n plus one reasons why this won't work. All right, let's stipulate to that. It is really simple to come up with all of the. Oh, well, what about this? Oh, this is terribly complex. Well, what about this? The effect of that is agency capture. Everybody worries about, oh, well, you know, the agency is captured. The ultimate agency capture is when nothing happens. And if we send, spend all of our time saying, well, there's this problem or there's that problem or whatever, then we are going to be succumbing to that problem. The other point that I would make, however, is that what we haven't discussed here is that the headline in Senator Bennett's bill is new agency. I think the real substance of the bill is he talks about a new procedure for that agency that moves from the old kind of uh, um, regulatory micromanagement model to a more agile risk management model by proposing a new structure that whoever it was back here that asked about industry standards groups that rips off that kind of idea, puts some teeth into it, and um, and gives it to uh, to an agency to a initiate, b um, oversee and participate in, uh, c make a uh, judgment about the ultimate outcome, and d then enforce. You know there is right now a there, there are, again, there are there's a multitude of, of, of industry uh, groups working on standards. I'll just pick on one. All of our homes are full of devices that talk to each other and report on us. Um, industry as a group working on standards, make sure that they can all interconnect. And they'll all work, hooray, we need that. Nowhere in the agenda is how are you gonna do with deal with privacy? Who's gonna address that in the industry if there isn't a body that says, hello, I wanna to bring together a group of subject matter experts that will have a defined function over a defined period of time in which I, I, the agency, will participate and then we'll make a decision as to whether this is a potential solution how to, and we maintain agility throughout that process. You know, how did we get from 1G to 2G to 3G to 4G to 5G, and now we're working on 6G? How was that agility created? It was, it was created by the standards process, and we need to hijack that kind of idea and bring it into government. One last point. The way government works today, or at least in my view, uh, is that we are practicing governmental Taylorism. Now, those of you, I didn't go to law school, I went to business school. And they taught us there about Frederick W. Taylor. And Frederick W. Taylor um, was the father of modern corporate management. And his, this was in the, in the uh, late 19th, and early 20th century. And his model was we take all choice out of behavior of employees and dictate everything from above. So you had a guy on the production line, and they were guys, you had a guy in the production line. 
to make sure that half a dozen of these guys were all doing the right thing, who was overseen by a manager and worked its way up in a bureaucratic, rules-based process. And we're surprised that we have a rules-based bureaucracy in the government that so many companies, and I think legitimately, are complaining thwarts innovation and thwarts investment. Companies aren't managed that way anymore, but we manage government that way. And so one of the key concepts in Senator Bennett's bill is that we need to have this new structure. And we need to have a debate about this new structure. But continuing to do things the way we are right now is not an answer for the future. All right, Julia, I'll let you have a quick point on that, then I've got a follow-up question for... Uh, oh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, Keisha, you have um, averted that you knew this question was coming. Let me pick up Tom's point. If you have a new type of regulatory strategy, can you teach an old dog, for example, the Federal Communications Commission, to do new tricks? Because one of the arguments could be, hey, these agencies, the FCC notably, has its own culture. If you're going to try to do things different, just take one example, algorithmic audits or working with standards bodies, are we better off starting from scratch? It's a, well, um, it's a good question. It's a hard question. I don't think I... I don't think I have a, a direct answer for you because I think it depends a lot on how that authority is conferred, the sorts of resources that you're willing to grant to an agency. So if I step back a little bit I, and look at the problem and then look at the sort of political economy to getting to either a new agency or to a moved FCC, it's really complicated, right? So the institutional design problem is really complicated, I think, here um, for reasons Maureen and Julie, you alluded to, which is sort of that there is a lot of um, sectoral expertise that might be required. There are things that are specific to automotive, things that are specific to electronics, but there's a lot of cross-cutting problems. And so how do you develop an agency that is both agile enough, but deep enough across these sectors? Um, and I don't know whether that you do that best by giving the FCC or the FTC that power, by creating a new agency or vesting a bunch of powers across the administrative state with a coordinating agency. There are lots of institutional design options there. I guess, and so this is not directly responsive to your question, but I think follows off of that, which is, so then what do we do, right, given the complexity here? And to pick up on what Tom said, you know, to do nothing is itself a policy choice. And so we have to decide whether or not we are okay with the status quo, or whether we at least try an option, and which option we try is a political economy option, right? So I would defer to you and to Senator Bennett and to all of you as sort of What's going to get something done? Is it a flashy new agency? Is it trying to give power to an existing agency? Whatever it is that gets something done, I think is likely to yield a better outcome than where we are today. Say that. So uh, to follow up on that, I, I agree with you 100%. It, it, it is very important to ask how is authority conferred? Uh, so I, I'm a strong believer that this has got to come through legislation and and Congress, uh, when you look at the FCC, you're looking at a very, uh, yes, broad statute in some ways, but directed. Uh, so when you talk about something like a public interest standard, you have some direction in the FCC of how to calculate that. Now it gives great, uh, some breadth, but it, it shows what legislative concerns is. There's a way of cabining that so it doesn't just uh, automatically overstep its boundaries. Uh, and then that said, uh, again, agreed to, to do nothing itself is a policy choice. But remember, uh, uh, there are other factors that discipline these industries. There is the market. There are consumers. There are uh, local, uh, not only uh, local institutions, whether there are private groups of concerns, whether it's the mothers that Senator Bennett talked about, or as uh, Phil talked about, we have legislation for privacy, et cetera. We have one in California too, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, so we do have those other ways of dealing with it. And I will push back strongly on saying that the ultimate agency capture is when nothing happens. I think that really uh, puts to the side what government can do 
wrong. There's quite a lot of conversation about how government can best solve the problem, but I'm not hearing much about how government itself can create the problem or can, in the case of agencies, as, as is often the case, really solidify incumbency in a way that we do not want, in a way that pushes uh, the problems forward without the disruptive effect, effect of newcomers and innovation. Uh, so th there has to be quite a bit of conversation over that. And talking about the FCC and agency, I am quite fond of, and I think is highly uh, well-functioning. It does not have the best of history uh, when it comes to dealing with new innovation. Uh, it has uh, helped arguably solidify monopoly power and concentration in the industry it was supposed to protect us from as, as the public and protect us from market failures. It's rather institutionalized that and probably carried them further, entrenched those interests much longer than they should have been because government is powerful. So let's be very clear about that as well when we're discussing how effectively we want to deal with this, that we're not falling victim of the nirvana fallacy that somehow government is going to be able to solve this uh, uh, seamlessly and without any cost. Uh, so I would uh, caution us as we go through that. When it comes to different, uh, again, I'll return to what I uh, signaled as where I'd like to see more legislation, uh, and that's in the privacy realm. I, I agree with Maureen that you would want to see that to the extent we give it to an agency to help with the enactment uh, to an agency that has some some uh, experience with that, and the FTC is the obvious play for that, and whether that means adding different um, uh, uh, skills and tools uh, to that, that that can be discussed. But to exclude uh, ex that experience, I think, is not necessary. I also find it very telling that when uh, looking just at the proposal of this new agency, it talks a lot about expertise, about the tax ex expertise, and, and looking at algorithms. But it doesn't talk to the balance that, that Maureen and Julie talked about uh, because, and again, yes, I am speaking in self-interest, there's not one economist mentioned uh, that we should hire economists and and have that sort of internal balancing. I, again, I think it's better to be in an agency where that type of uh, a combination of statutory direction, plus to the extent rules need to be made, that it be made with that inherent balancing that both the tech people and economists working together can bring to light. So. Um, so I question was, you know, what are the tools that we should be thinking about and would those best be deployed by a new agency? I want to um, echo something Teja said. I do think there's a certain amount of energy when you have a new agency, but um, I really don't think that's going to address the, the problem. When I think about what is happening around the globe, I mean, one of the issues that I find missing from the current debate in Washington from the current discussions around FCC, FTC, um, et cetera, CFPB, is the agencies are not really working together. And I think there's a real value, and again, looking across the pond, the other pond on the other side of the country, where, uh, and looking a little bit at what the UK, the French, and the, and the Dutch are doing. So the UK, about two years, two or actually three years ago now, instituted an organization that they called the Digital, Digital Regulation Cooperation Forum. And it brings together the privacy regulator, which is known as the Information Commissioner's Office, the competition regulator, which is known as the CMA or Competition and Markets Authority, the, uh, off, the Ofcom, which is basically their FCC, as well as the Financial Conduct Authority, which regulates banks. And it brings these organizations together to develop um, an approach to big problems. So what they're doing is looking at things like AI, looking at other issues and saying, how can we work together? What are the different tools that each of us has? And how can we come up with solutions? So again, something I said earlier, you know, recognizing a problem and focusing on how to solve it, 
I first talked about this, that the tech industry needs to do this, actually all of the business community needs to do it. I think regulators need to do that too. What is the problem? What are the tools we have? How can we work together? So I think that this was a really innovative um, approach that could absolutely be mimicked in the United States like that. And it wouldn't, it doesn't require legislation. It doesn't require necessarily a whole bunch of funding. And it is something that I think could move the ball forward quite significantly. I also think a big part of the Senator's um, proposal, and you know, we just need to talk about it. Yes, he does talk about a new structure, a new way of thinking about things. And I wanna to come to standards in a second. But what he really is talking about is funding. I mean, when you stand up a new agency, it's money, it's people, it's, it's, it's resources. I mentioned the ICO uh, in the UK, 1,000 employees to cover privacy. It, the FTC, what are we at? Maybe 100? And think about the difference in the economies. Think about the difference in the oversight of the, the nature of the businesses at stake and, and uh, you know, what is being done in the United States, both in a very positive way and also creating some problems. I mean, you can't start to address problems unless you develop a path to solutions. And some of that, frankly, if you're gonna bring in expertise, whether it's economists or technologists, people who really can explain, what is the cloud? How does that really work? I mean, that is a very complicated issue. Um, you know, you need to have resources. So look, in, in the current environment, unfortunately, I think a lot of the agencies are largely starved for resources, certainly compared to the scope of the problem. So I just think we need to put that on the table. So whether it's adding more resources to one or the other of our current uh, agencies under discussion, or whether we bring them together to talk more cooperatively about developing solutions and give them both resources or create a special body within these organizations, one way or the other, to me, honestly, the format isn't as important as recognizing that funding is needed and we are starving these agencies. The other thing that I just, oh, and I'll also point out that in Europe, I mean, they are like the, the, comp, the uh, competition um, unit of the European Commission, um, their uh, uh, FCC equivalent, uh, in uh, the European Commission because of these new laws, which we'll probably talk about soon, they are hiring like mad. I mean, there, is, there are huge amounts of resources that are going into this issue in Europe. Uh, resources. Okay, the last thing I want to just touch on standards for a second. So I do agree with the examples that you've given, Tom. I thought those were really interesting. They're actually, um, ISO actually has done privacy standards. It actually is about to consummate an AI standard. There's um, sort of a foundational privacy standard, um, which I won't just, uh, give you the name because it's basically known by its numbers. And then there's the privacy information management system. Uh, and, and similarly on AI, it's called an AI management system or AIMS. And what these standards are doing in the real marketplace with respect to entities like Microsoft, because what we do is we provide um, cloud and other productivity services to other businesses. So why they're impactful is our customers come to us and they say, are you complying with PIMS? Or will we have the right to do an audit against PIMS, against the Privacy Information Management System? Now, I don't think this gets to the issues that we're talking about with user-facing platforms, and that's been a lot of the discussion today. But there is a lot of um, work that's happening in the marketplace in the absence of legislation uh, to allow businesses to communicate with each other about privacy practices, and there will be something also in place with respect to AI practices. Does, and I think does, that's pretty does any federal agency have engagement or oversight of that type of work? Uh, not, not at this point, unless you go across the pond. No, I, and I, across I, the pond, they have audit rights that are gonna be imposed upon more of the consumer facing platforms. But the audit rights that do happen, I mean, you know, those are pretty, pretty significant audits. 
Well, I think that in the United States, that would be, I think, take it Tom's point. And in Colorado's privacy law, there's a requirement that business have a data assessment. And exactly. We have an ability to oversee that. Right, so right, I think right. that architecture, um, I want to get the old questions from the audience, but Maureen, let me give you the last look at this. We talked earlier about the Federal Trade Commission, its tools. If Congress were looking at a bill with things like new privacy authority, overseeing AI, algorithmic audits, and you're asked to testify, is your view the FTC can handle all this, maybe some goes to the FCC or create a new agency. How do you see it? Um, so if there's going to be new authorities, and Julie makes an excellent point, and I think others have too, the resources, right? So mm -hmm. the FTC's budget, when I was the chairman of the Federal Trade Commission, you know, their budget is like close maybe $340 million, right? That's really tiny. And that's between consumer protection and antitrust. So, so I think... Um, if the FTC were given more resources, more clearly defined tools where Congress has laid out the, the appropriate guidelines, uh, I think the FTC could, could be a really good home for that. But I do think some of the issues that we're seeing at the FTC now will, will need to be addressed. Reinforcing bipartisanship at the FTC, Making sure there's due process, you know, all those all those kinds of things. But one of the things that Tom um, you mentioned uh, that I really really like is the idea of avoiding micromanagement, right, and avoiding utility style regulation. I I, I have great concerns when when I when I hear people say we should have railroad style regulation, right, for the you know, it's like that just is not a good just not a good idea for for, for many many reasons, and. Traditionally, that's not a route the FTC has taken, right? So it's had this very general authority, and it has looked at um, how the impact is on consumers, right? For the consumer protection and um, competition, consumer welfare standard in, in antitrust. Um, and so it's been much more goals oriented than how you get there oriented. And I think that is an important thing to keep to keep in mind. So given some of the great successes that I think the FTC has had in deploying its authority to date. To me, it seems like with more money, more guidelines, more um, care in, in how some of these new powers would be given, the FTC would be a good, a good home for that. Could, could I comment? One second on the money sure. side. Violent agreement <laughs> with my colleagues here. I remember testifying and the half of the FCC's budget and being told by the chairman of the Appropriations Committee, Mr. Wheeler, you don't understand. I want you to do less with less. Ray Sepsa, folks, right? He said he didn't go to law school, too. Um, <laughs> all right, so we have a lot of great students here. I need some help from Blake, who's already pointing to one to follow the so-called wiser rule for the first question. Yes. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to have this conversation. My name is Brielle Bayans. I am a senior at the University of Colorado Boulder, and I'm also a former Startup Summer participant. Um, so we are currently in the midst of Colorado Privacy Act rulemaking, and there are also um, other state laws um, such as California, Utah, and I think Virginia. I'm wondering how those state level actions for laws and regulations um, regarding data privacy have influenced um, federal action or inaction within this space. is that I think it's gotten a lot more people seriously to the table about getting a federal privacy bill passed. Um, it's, we've had discussions over time that kind of didn't go anywhere. And now as the states have really started to step in and, and make their own laws, I think it's, it's created a lot more momentum and seriousness. Uh, I don't know if it'll get us over the line, but I, I do think it's been a, a useful spur and you know some really great thinking in the states that a federal bill can build upon. I think that's such a great question. So thank you for asking it. I would say it has both um, accelerated um, that the the advent of these uh, five, six state laws, uh, Connecticut as well, um, which are very good laws and they've improved in building upon each other very similarly to what we saw in the data breach notification space where California went first, other states adopted, they looked at each other. 
um, the end result is no federal law in that space of data breach notification. And I think um, there's going to be a tension. I agree with Maureen that uh, you know these several laws that have been adopted in the states have motivated some to come forward and say we need we need a privacy law that at the federal level. At the same time, it has also um, highlighted the obstacles to doing so, particularly around preemption and private right of action. And I think that is one of the core areas where I feel like I want to go back to what I said before. We need to get acclimated once again to the old custom of learning how to compromise. I do think that there are compromises in both of those spaces of preemption and private right of action. You know, there, uh, you know, it would be a first run at it, see if we can get compromises in both of those areas. And if it doesn't work, again, <laughs> remembering that we actually can iterate. Um, I think one of the problems is uh, right now, there's been so much deadlock at the federal level that people are worried that if they don't get we don't get it right the first time that's it that's the last opportunity we'll have and I, you can't discount that i mean there is a certain reality to that although you can also build provisions into a law that require revisiting whether it's sunsetting whether it's re, you know reconsidering certain provisions or you know sunsetting particular provisions so there's a lot more creativity i think that can be brought to the conversation. So I see the state, I, per, you know, we're deeply supportive of the state laws. I spent many, many years at um, two state attorney general's offices. I pushed forward for these laws, I think, at, at that time. And I still think that they're great. I, I just think the reality is that there's complications now as a result of, of them. Thank you so much for your quick Oscar Wilde in Lady Windermere's Fan says there are two great tragedies in life, not getting what you want and getting it. The reality for the industries that would be affected by privacy legislation is that they have gotten what they want, which is nothing. Second point is that my experience in 40 years of representing industry before the Congress and the commission is that you have to go back to the point that both of my colleagues are making here about you've got to find something that's a get for everybody. The reason why we got the Communications Act in 96 was only because the Lex got something and the IXCs got something. That's how you put legislation together and the problem is that everybody's sitting there right now and saying, I don't have it. And I'm hopeful. And I think what I've heard from these two is that, is that if there are enough states that balkanize the way in which interconnected companies operate, that they will be forced to say, no, wait a minute, I need one set of rules. Let's come to the table and deal. So a couple thoughts. Unfortunately, in data breach, that has not happened. We have 50 states with slightly different standards in data breach. It has not prompted Congress to act. When Tom Wheeler was working at the National Cable Television Association and Tim Worth and Tom Talkey were the respective leaders and minority um, leaders in the House Telecom Subcommittee, they actually made policy in processes like you're seeing here. Part of the problem is that Congress has lost that ability. The state of Colorado did that in creating a privacy law. We're doing that with rulemaking. I really hope our federal government can start legislating. I agree with Maureen. It is a abdication of Congress's responsibility on privacy with widespread concern. Teen mental health, widespread concern. If we can't get that leadership from Congress, we're gonna live in what I've called the second best world, which is the states will keep doing it and they'll do slightly differently. And then it's on us to try to figure out how to be interoperable with one another so we don't put companies into the impossible position that Tom is warning about, where one state says you have to do it this way, X, and no state has to do it this way, Y, and you can't comply with both. All right, another question. Is there another student out there first or? Yes, there is. All right, next student. Uh, so my name is Graham, I'm a 3L. Uh, I want to preface uh, return back to the question of a new agency and, and preface that I love that idea because it's just more job opportunities. But um, uh, one concern that, that I have uh, in terms of looking at, at current examples uh, with the creation of a new agency is obviously there's 
the uh, possibility of uh, jurisdictional overlap or content overlap. And I think we've already seen a lot of issues with coordination problems in existing agencies. And I'm wondering if you guys have any thoughts on how those might be addressed if we were looking at either expanding jurisdiction of existing agencies or creating a new agency and how we could sort of promote coordination and cooperation between them. Thank you. It's a really great point. It picks up of what Julie talked about what's happening in Britain. And let me ask Julie to start with this, which is in the US, having independent agencies that function differently in kind than executive branch agencies, coordination led by the White House, for example, and things like artificial intelligence is a little trickier. Mm -hmm. um, how, how would you envision the US doing what you are seeing doing Sunwell elsewhere? Yeah, I mean, the, the agencies that are cooperating in uh, the UK and in France and the Netherlands, uh, most of them are independent. They yeah. have to be in there. I mean, independence is a um, an elastic term, uh, shall we say? I mean, they but they they largely are independent. Look, I I think it goes. I, I think it's a great question. I do think um, it requires uh, you know a new mindset around agencies, which is your victories aren't the number of um, cases you bring or you know the number of dollars that you individually as an agency bring in, but really, are you solving a problem? And are you creating new uh, approaches to dealing with new problems, uh, like the Senator was talking about mental health, like I am bringing up with respect to child sexually and abusive material? Are we really trying to get at problems? And I think that if we can sort of change the balance sheet in the sense of wins and losses, uh, for agencies so that it's it's not so much that they're judged individually, but they're judged as a group, whether it's by society, by, by the media, or by Congress. I think that would go a long way to helping. I do think that there's a territorialism, uh, as you say, but I think it, it, it largely comes from some of those issues around how do you prove your own worth, which we see among human beings just generally. And I think if we start thinking more about the collective problem and solution, we Get, we get closer to that. And clearly that's been happening in Europe um, because they are much more than we are focused on the bigger problems and how to create uh, uh, structures that will e more easily than currently available new structures to try to address those problems. Let me see if I can leave our remaining panelists with uh, if they have their final thoughts in 30 seconds or so. So pay us first. Oh, okay. Um, well, on the, on the question, I just want to say that we have examples of, of White House coordination, even among independent agencies. So, you know, the FTC and the FCC have been at it for some time um, over net neutrality in 2015, over do not call before then. And the White House has stepped in and has done and has, you know, done some tacit coordination in ways that are maybe not as direct as it is in, in, with executive agencies, but it's still evidence of the sort of political accountability that we should want and would want from the administrative state. So in the spirit of a last word, I guess the thing that I wanna say is, you know, responding quickly, Babette, to what you said, I can concede that the government might get it wrong, right? Just as the companies, I think, have gotten it wrong. Um, and so we have to do an error cost analysis and decide which error is worse and which error is more easily addressed. As for worse, I, I don't know, I'm more confident in an agency that has the likes of, you know, Commissioner Brill, Chairman Wheeler, Commissioner Ohio, than governance by Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg. Um, and as for <laughs> and, and as for whether we can rectify those 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 errors, I think that democratic governance is more likely to succeed in this context than market discipline. Sounds almost like you're saying some of this is affected with the public interest, to quote from a <laughs> case involving uh, I think it was grain elevators back in the day. Um, Babette, um, Final thoughts? Uh, final thoughts just to the question. Again, I do think there's a lot of examples of interagency agreement. Uh, sometimes I think that would be uh, surprising in a good way to the general public. Uh, so the FCC, uh, the agency with, that I have the most experience with, 
uh, actually works quite well with others, plays well in the sandbox and uh, has a very fluid coordination, even to the point of exchanging experts. As you might imagine, the FCC has key engineers and other uh, assets which are not common in other uh, agencies. So you'll see that kind of sharing of resources as well as of jurisdiction. So I do think that is overcomable. Now in a new agency like this, which is going to enter into so much of the economy, that's a little uh, potentially far more problematic uh, because it's not as well defined what the parameters might be when you're thinking about your car self-driving and IoT and all of those different things. So that might raise new concerns uh, that would not be a concern if they're put together uh, in other agencies. And uh, I do think that this comes down to some things in error costs. Uh, I agree with that 100%. Uh, I might come down on different ways, uh, but I do think that uh, I find that the first step should be with Congress laying out the groundwork. I agree 1,000%. It should be on the things most common, low-hanging fruit. I love that, uh, which is both privacy. I do think that's percolating. And absolutely with uh, uh, children on the internet, for goodness sake, those things are already illegal. And look at what we have. Uh, so why are we not uh, working with that and developing those laws even further to protect the new dangers online that we are seeing? Uh, I, I find it very interesting too that uh, in a strain, TikTok has been incredibly unresponsive to its consumers who are self-identifying predators online and TikTok does nothing. That's low hanging fruit for a government agency to deal with. That should not stand. And to its credit, you know, Facebook is trying to respond at least in the marketplace to do something different. Hopefully they will put in better restraints, but if not, then a government agency would be well used in that space. Uh, and concerns about democracy. Uh, I think it's also important to keep in mind that our constitutional structure is meant to protect this, and that includes having the right decision makers make the decisions. So we need really um, Congress to act, but it's also respect for the First Amendment, right? And I, I'm you know, a little worried that some of that is getting a little bit lost. So we really do need Congress to act in this space, particularly on privacy, uh, but not lose sight of the fact that using data for consumers, um, it, that using data is good for consumers and it's good for competition. Um, and that's often why I kind of refer back to the Fair Credit Reporting Act that struck that balance so, so effectively. Um, and that we shouldn't disregard that and lose sight of that when we're kind of often being swept up in a lot of anti-tech rhetoric. I mean, I think that there's a very fundamental value to get striking the balance correctly for the benefit of consumers and for competition uh, and for economic growth in the U.S. Um, so whether it is a new agency um, or it goes to, you know, an agency like the FTC, I think those are some really important kind of guiding lights that we, that we need to follow, constitutional structure, respect the First Amendment, and understanding the value of data and the benefits of data usage. Tom, do you want to get the last word? Julie. Julie got the first word on this. No, no, I'm saying I'm, I'm happy. Yes, I don't, I'm not the last word. Julie will get the last word. All right, get you the, Julie, no, I'm, Julie, Tom, and Julie. I'm, 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 okay, I'm, Julie, I'm, I'm Julie, happy. and then Tom. Because I'm, I'm, Julie, Julie, I'm just going to close with shameless self-promotion. Okay. okay, that I've got a book <laughs> coming out later this year. And the title says it all. The title is Tech Lash, colon, Who Makes the Rules in the Digital Gilded Age? And we've talked a lot today about, hey, we've been here before. That's the first half of the book. We've been here before when we set up rules for the industrial. Second half of the book is and are we going to do anything about that when we're living through a digital era that is based on different concepts and different market economics? And what we're, today we're seeing is we're seeing that the digital marketplace, the rules for the digital market are being made by a handful of autocrats, digital autocrats. 
and it's time for we the people to step up and say, no, we need a countervailing force in here that is gonna look out for the public interest and the rights of individuals. Um, so, uh, real quick, uh, Brad Smith also has a book, which he calls, uh, it is a great book. It is a great book. It's called Tools and Weapons. And I think that the title is a really um, apt one because it talks about how technology has done remarkable things for us. And we haven't spent nearly any time uh, today talking about some of the re remarkable things that um, technology brought for us, whether during the pandemic, whether helping with the Ukraine war, whether dealing with climate change. I mean, I think it is important to focus on that uh, as you're trying to develop an appropriately balanced regulatory approach. Um, so the other thing that I think I'll, I, I would like to close with is just, I mean, I think the United States is so accustomed to being the, the big, bad bully um, in the global space in terms of we get what we want because we're the biggest and we're the best. And we do have the biggest economy, but we do when it, a monetary economy, but we do not have the biggest regulatory economy. Our economy, and by that I mean we're we just don't embrace thinking really creatively anymore about how to develop approaches to hard problems. And so I would suggest that the United States should approach this issue with humility and say, okay, we have, we're not there right now. Let's look at what Europe is doing. Let's look at what Japan is doing. Let's look at some of the organizations that are coming together around some of these issues and try to learn from them. It doesn't mean by any means that we want to adopt what they do necessarily whole hog, but there's a lot of goodness in thinking through in a, in a scalpel, with a scalpel approach, what are the ex ante rules that we want to bring to technology? Because that is, in, that is indeed what Europe is doing. That's what Australia is doing. And it is what the UK is doing. And those are global centers of regulatory thought right now. So is China. And the United States needs to be there too. And so we need to join in the conversation because by not doing something, the rest of the world is moving forward. And global companies that are trying to operate everywhere, we're aligning with what other countries tell us to do because that's the guard, those are the guardrails we have. So I just think a little bit more humility and saying, yeah, you know, we actually do have stuff to learn. We're a little bit behind in 2023. I think that would go a long way here. Can we thank our panel for a great conversation?